I'm back with part two of two of my countdown for a hospitalist's 100 pet peeves while in the hospital. To recap on part one, none of these are about patients. Instead, even when they seem critical of specific specialties or roles, they are really all about the system, including how much of what we are taught to do is without evidence, is in contradiction to evidence, or sometimes even without logic to support it. Each peeve is ranked on a, uh, on a scale based on how frustrating I personally find it to be, how detrimental to patient care it is, how common it is, and how easy it would be to fix. Many of these are just my personal opinion and the numbers are arbitrary, but when there is good evidence or at least a strong consensus on which a particular peeve is, uh, rests, I have a link to a relevant reference in the video description. When a CT with contrast is blocked for the sole reason of an elevated serum creatinine, um, irrespective of other factors, including the indication for the scan. So, you know, people, you know, are still debating how much of an effect that IV contrast for a CT scan has on people's kidney function. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who feel like there is no impact whatsoever. Um, but even among people who think that maybe there is an impact, still, you have to consider many other factors. You know, if you're worried about contrast-induced nephropathy, their serum creatinine is not the only factor that goes into determining someone's risk of that, even among people who believe that that's even a thing. So you have to worry about things like, you know, concurrent heart failure. You know, how heavy are they? How large are they? How, how old are they? What's their age? Um, and then, of course, worry about the indication for the scan and how emergent is the scan? Is there, is there a good alternative uh, test that could get the same information or is there not? Um, these things should all be considered. You should never have a CT scan with contrast refused for the sole reason of a high creatinine. Turning code status, DNR, DNI, and an admission HMP without any indication as to how that decision was made. Um, this has become less common now. You know, our EMR, for example, at our hospital um, will prompt the person writing the HMP and putting in a code status to actually leave a little goals of care note um, that re sort of very strongly hints at uh, a need to provide some kind of explanation for the code status. So this isn't very common anymore. My, my old hospital, this used to happen all the time. Reflexively checking BID electrolytes in every patient on diuretics. Um, this is sometimes appropriate, but it's often not necessary. Documenting a patient's neuro exam as, quote, non-focal. When I, when I see written down a neuro exam was non-focal, I interpret that to mean that they did not do a neuro exam. Not assessing the gait of a patient on admission, uh, which is particularly frustrating if the chief complaint or the reason the patient came to the hospital was for weakness or falls. When a doctor consistently orders routine fluids, meds, labs, and radiology studies as, quote, stat. In the hospital, if everything is ordered as stat, nothing becomes stat. Uh, ordering acetaminophen as the only PRN pain medication in a patient whose chief complaint is pain. <laughs> yes, that happens. <laughs> Refusing to give narcotics to an inpatient with a history of substance abuse, irrespective of how severe their acute pain is. I understand wanting to be more cautious. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, if someone has a history of, of narcotic um, dependence and they come into the hospital with a ruptured appendix... You know, I, I think it's not unreasonable to give that patient some ac acute narcotic to get their pain under control. Like, it's it's not going to make or break their, uh, their long-term drug abuse problem. Um, refusing to, oh, sorry. Assuming a patient with an irregular pulse has AFib without checking an ECG. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is sort of analogous to the patient who is a smoker and a chronic cough, assuming they have COPD. Um, but this one's actually more frustrating, I think, because with with an irregular pulse, you know, getting an ECG is so much easier than getting pulmonary function tests. So there is really there's no excuse to not get an ECG before diagnosing uh, atrial fibrillation. When the respiratory rate of every patient on the ward is documented as either 18 or 20, I don't know why this like that's how, like where this comes from or why it happens. It seems to be consistent in every hospital that I've worked at. And I've seen other people online who talk about their, their own hospitals, and they also joke about this phenomenon. Next, uh, using pre-albumin to assess nutritional status. So, uh, 
you know, the, the reason that this is often cited by people as a re why they do this is that pre-albumin has a shorter half-life than albumin does. So therefore, you know, when someone's nutritional status gets better or worse, pre-albumin will change before albumin does. But that logic is based on a really, really bad assumption, not even an assumption, a, a bad error. I'm thinking that pre-albumin is a precursor to albumin. A and it is not. They're not the same molecule at all. Pre-albumin and albumin have nothing to do with one another. It's called pre-albumin because of how it migrates on a gel. It migrates in, in the sense that it ends up being uh, before albumin <laughs> on a gel during, uh, you know, when it's exposed to an electric current. Um, and it is not, pre-albumin is not a marker of nutrition. It, it isn't. Uh, admitting a patient for rule out MI and then not mentioning their ECG in the admission HMP. Um, this is so common. It's, it's so frustrating. And I think, I think part of it has to do with the fact that with an EMR, uh, when you're writing an admission HMP in the EMR, at least with Epic, it imports, uh, radiology studies automatically. And so you really can't have a, a, um, a HMP without mentioning a chest X-ray um, if a chest, a chest X-ray was done. But it does not automatically import in the ECG um, re report. And a lot of people just don't put it in. Or they'll put in something really, really basic like you know, ECG, uh, you know, normal sinus rhythm or NSR. And like that's 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 completely not okay when you especially now it's not okay in any patient to write to do that. But for your patient who's coming in because they're having chest pain and being admitted for rule out MI, you have to describe the ECG um, in much more specific terms than normal sinus rhythm um, or let alone ignore it altogether. Unnecessary use of oxygen. So oxygen is, is not benign in the hospital. Um, if someone's not hypoxic, there's really very few reasons to treat them with oxygen. There's, a, there's, there's not zero reasons. There are a few reasons, but there are very few. And uh, we, you know, we used to joke about oxygen. You know, we would come in uh, to a patient room. They see that they're standing 100% on, uh, you know, on four liters. And we turn them down to two liters and, and wait a few minutes. And they're still standing 100%. And we turn them down to room air and take them off oxygen. And we, they, we sit there and we talk to them for a few minutes. And they're still on room air. Uh, they're, they're standing 100%. And we think, oh, this patient's fine. They're off. They're fine off oxygen. And we leave the room, and then we come back a few hours later. And the patient's back on oxygen again, setting 100%, with no explanation anywhere as to why they went back on oxygen. And we used to joke that it was like the oxygen fairy was, you know, coming by every pay for every patient's room and just putting them back on every patient that we would take off oxygen, the oxygen fairy would come by, put them back on oxygen again. And I think what probably happens is, is a combination of two things. One is that. Um, we don't do a good job with telling the nursing staff when we've taken someone off oxygen and explaining why we did that. I, I think if we did a better job with that, this would not happen a lot less. I think also what then happens is patients on continuous oxygen monitoring unnecessarily. Um, you know, sometimes the oxygen level will, will dip down very briefly for either because they're sleeping and they dips down into like the lower mid 90s for a few moments because of sleep apnea or because um, uh, a bad reading you know, just not getting a good signal. And so it drops down because of that. And someone comes in like, oh my gosh, this patient is, you know, desatting to 90%. We have to get them back to 100% or they're desatting to 95%, even though that's perfectly fine. Um, and they have to get them back to 100% and put them back on oxygen. And they just don't document that anywhere. Um, so I think it's, it's a multi, it's a, it's not just one person or one, one role at the hospital who's, who's, uh, whose fault this is, but it still is a pet peeve of mine to see it. When house staff sign, when house staff, sign out to the on-call team and spend 30 seconds on each of 10 patients rather than handing over a list of nine patients with no statement and spending five minutes discussing the one patient who is particularly sick and complicated. Uh, using the heart rate as a primary indicator of volume status. Um, yes, patients who are dehydrated will get tachycardic. Patients who are anxious will get tachycardic. Patients who are febrile will get tachycardic. Patients in pain get tachycardic. Patients who are in heart failure get tachycardic. Uh, tachycardia is not a good sign of uh, volume depletion. Uh, don't use it to dictate volume management. Unnecessary polypharmacy in the elderly. Uh, polypharmacy in anybody, that is uh, the term used to describe when a patient is on uh, a lot of different medications which are either excessive and or which are likely to have drug-drug interactions. 
That's problematic in all individuals, but it is particularly problematic in the elderly, and they can get really confused, uh, like like as in like actual confusion um, from polypharmacy. So uh, really, really be cautious when you when you're adding a new medication to a, a an elderly patient who's already on lots of new or already on lots of medications. Really double check that list to make sure every medication is actually needed. Double check it, triple check it for um, drug drug interactions, or ask your pharmacist to, to double check it. When a patient with mild hyperkalemia and no ECG changes is given a full smorgasbord of hyperkalemia treatment, meaning uh, calcium, insulin plus glucose, bicarb, albuterol, and tons and tons of caxalate. So your, your risk of, of having a fatal arrhythmia uh, from hyperkalemia, it's related to a couple things. Uh, one is the speed with which hyperkalemia developed, uh, but the other is whether or not there's ECG changes. And in a patient with mild hyperkalemia, I mean like, you know, potassium in the 5.5 to 6.0 range, who has an ECG that's that's completely normal or is unchanged from the baseline, um, that patient's not going to get some fatal ventricular arrhythmia from their hyperkalemia in the next, you know, handful of minutes or even handful of hours. And so you don't necessarily need to like throw the kitchen sink at them. You know, give them, you know, maybe not caxalate, give them, uh, you know, sort of a more 21st century medication to bring their potassium down. Um, but you don't necessarily need to break out the insulin and glucose and the calcium and whatnot. Like that's, those medications don't even, they, they don't even last long enough for it to be helpful. Like if you're worried about the patient getting hyperkalemic more severely, like six, six, six or 12 hours later, the calcium, its effect on hyperkalemia wears off after like an hour. So there's like, there's really no reason to, to give it for patients without ECG changes. <clears throat> um, next, atenolol. Oh my gosh, atenolol. Uh, atenolol is a beta blocker. It was used very commonly in the 80s for uh, management of hypertension. There is a lot of great evidence that it is no better than placebo for uh, a whole host of patient-centered outcomes. Um, it, it, it can lower the blood pressure. It does not reduce your risk of, of heart attacks or death or etc. So um, why that's the case is an interesting discussion we don't have time for. But really, you should... Whenever you see a tenolol on a, on a medication list, you should you should cringe and think about how you're going to get the patient transitioned to a better choice for the 21st century. <clears throat> a mention of a patient's race in the chief complaint line. This also was really commonly done um, a long time ago and was really considered sort of conventional practice. You know, uh, Mrs. Smith is a, or Mrs. Jones is a 50 year old uh, African American woman, or you know, Mr. Lee is a 65 uh, Asian man. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We don't recommend that for a number of reasons. Uh, the primary one is that it actually leads to sort of subconscious bias, um, either subconscious bias against the patient um, as an individual or subconscious bias towards or away to certain diagnoses um, in, in a way that is far in excess of what impact that person's race actually does have on that diagnosis. So this doesn't mean that their, their uh, self-identified race isn't relevant. Um, it's something that we typically put into the social history um, but I would, I would not put it in the chief complaint line. Um, admitting a patient for any pulmonary complaint and relying on the formal interpretation of the chest X-ray without even looking at it oneself. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, anyone in internal medicine, anyone who's on one of my, my teams, you know, any internal medicine intern or, or resident, um, we know we expect you to have some skill with interpreting a chest X-ray. Uh, especially since chest x-rays, at least as of 2023, are not automatically read by some AI, like you might assume ECG machines uh, do for ECGs. So I, I really, you know, interns and residents, they should, they should know how to read a chest x-ray. They should look at the chest x-ray themselves. Um, and, you know, like, and the reason for that is, that, you know, the radiology report, you know, obviously the radiologist is going to be more skilled at reading the x-ray than the, than the intern or the resident or even myself. But there are sometimes there are some things that aren't, they, they're, they're difficult to convey in, in words, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. That's true of chest X-rays. You know, when someone talks about the fact that someone's got, you know, uh, uh, infiltrate at the right lung base, like what exactly does that mean? Does that look like pneumonia? Does it look like it's aspiration? Does it look like it's fluid? If you, like what it, what does infiltrate mean? Um, how bad is it? How severe is it? How convincing is it? Especially if someone has, you know, sort of other symptoms and signs of a pulmonary complaint that aren't really pushing you one direction or another. Um, just look at the film. It, it takes 10 seconds to do. Just take a look at it. When the ED gives antibiotics with, without first acquiring relevant cultures, um, 
I don't know why this happens. This really shouldn't happen. I don't know why it happens. It's it's not super common, but it still does. When a medicine uh, admitting resident and either the ED or another admitting service argue for an hour about an admission, meaning which service the patient should be admitted to, uh, without anyone alter, uh, alerting a relevant attending. So if, you know, I tell my residents, you know, if they get into a dispute with another service about who should admit a patient, if they can't resolve it in five minutes, like, don't keep going back and forth for an hour. Like, if you can't resolve it, resolve it in five minutes, let me know. And that's not because, like, I want to I want to get up and, all up in someone's face about it. I don't. It's not because I don't trust the resident to, to be able to figure out themselves. It's just, it's a waste of time. Like, when you're admitting, you know, when you're on call and admitting patients, like, there are so many other things going on. You don't have time to go back and forth with some silly debate about whether or not someone belongs on internal medicine or general surgery. Um, especially when that debate could be solved by an attending to attending call that takes two minutes. So if you can't, if you can't figure it out in five minutes, let your attending know about it. Um, being excessively dogmatic with antibiotic courses in situations of significant diagnostic uncertainty. So this one is something that I feel like um, is, I, when, I, when, I, when I bring this up, people get confused by what I mean. And, and I've been meaning to make an entire video about this, but never felt like quite enough material to make a video on. But in, in essence, it was what this means. So if you have someone who you think has um, endocarditis and you're going to, you know, and you're 100% sure they have endocarditis, you are going to give them six weeks of IV antibiotics. You know, they have, you know, how do we determine that six weeks of IV antibiotics is appropriate treatment for endocarditis? That's because six weeks is determined, you know, to, maybe with some evidence, but with a lot of expert consensus as well and, and experience. That's the point in which continuing the antibiotics longer than six weeks the harm for the antibiotics, or including the cost of antibiotics, outweighs the benefit from the antibiotics. So in other words, most patients will be cured at six weeks, and the tiny, tiny fraction that won't be cured by six weeks, that still need more longer courses, um, that's going to be more than outweighed by all the extra harm given to everyone else who already was cured by unnecessarily extending the antibiotics longer. So if six weeks is the optimal length of time for someone who, who with whom you're a hundred percent certain that has endocarditis. What do you do for someone who you're maybe 50% sure they have endocarditis? That patient, you know, if you treat them for six weeks of antibiotics, they're still going to have as much harm from the antibiotics because they're, they're still getting the antibiotics. They're still, they're still getting the harm from a uh, risk of, you know, pick line infections, risk of C. diff colitis, you know, the, the, the cost of the, the, of the medications, etc. But the expected benefit is literally going to be 50% the expected benefit of the person who, in whom you are 100% sure of. Because there's only a 50% chance you've gotten the diagnosis correct. And so it would not make sense. I'm not suggesting that person should be on 50% as long a course. You know, I'm not suggesting you give that person three weeks. But it doesn't make sense for that person to necessarily get six weeks. You know, what does that mean? Does that mean five weeks? Does that mean five and a half weeks? I don't know. Maybe. And what if you have a patient in whom you're like 10% sure they have endocarditis? And for some reason, for whatever reason, you can't further estimate, you can't further clarify the estimate. That's as, that's as good an estimate as you're going to get. Do you really want to treat that patient with six weeks of antibiotics in whom you're 10% sure they have endocarditis? I, I, I would argue no. I would argue that, that was, that's a mistake. And uh, people push back about on this a lot. Uh, ID docs in particular, they like, they like to be dogmatic with things like endocarditis. But to me... It, it doesn't make any sense. Like I said, one of these days I'll get around to, to um, making a longer video about it. Next, starting lactulose in a patient with mild cirrhosis and no history of symptoms attributable to encephalopathy. So lactulose, um, it's, don't give lactulose as, a, as, a, as for primary prophylaxis. Um, you know, it is, uh, <coughs> it treats uh, symptoms of encephalopathy. Don't use it to prevent symptoms of encephalopathy. That's, that's just... Lactulose is an unpleasant medication to take. gives you a lot of bloating. gives you, gives you diarrhea. The diarrhea is not a side effect of lactulose. Diarrhea is its mechanism of action. So um, you know it's a very prominent feature of lactulose treatment. Um, it's really un it's really unpleasant. So don't don't use it unless you really need to. Deciding against the use of metformin in a patient solely because the creatinine is above a relatively low and arbitrary cutoff. So like with IV contrast and creatinine. Uh, people get really freaked out about metformin and creatinine. Um, people think like, oh my gosh, metformin is going to cause lactic acidosis, etc. 
Um, I'm not saying that it's never a concern and that you should ignore kidney failure and metformin or ignore that combination, but I think people exaggerate. Uh, they have, I should say, they, they an exaggerated um, impression of how bad a combination is of metformin and a mildly elevated creatinine. Continuing four times a day, finger sticks for weeks in the chronic patients whose type 2 diabetes is controlled well enough to never require insulin. Um, you know, finger sticks suck. They're, they're uncomfortable. They're unpleasant. It takes time for the nurses to do. Um, they have to re then record the results, which, you know, if someone's not requiring insulin for many weeks, you're probably not even checking what those results are that the nurses are having to document. So just, just get rid of the finger sticks altogether, you know, and if you need to, if, you, if you're worried about something flaring up, the diabetes is getting worse or, or whatnot, um, you know, just check it once a day with the, uh, the Chem 7 in the morning. And that's, that's probably sufficient for patients who have been stable for a long time. When the reason for a patient's admission and or their documented chief complaint is altered mental status without any further description. So I, I, have, a whole, uh, I have a whole discussion of, of all the different forms of altered mental status in a video uh, appropriately, appropriately called an approach to altered mental status. So if you wanted to understand what I meant by that, you can check out that video and I have a very detailed discussion, discussion of it there. Placing a patient on two hemodynamic drugs simultaneously, which have direct antagonizing effects, such as uh, midodrain and hydralazine, or you have someone on intravenous fluids and furosemide at the same time, uh, which maybe has like one relatively uncommon indication for, uh, but uh, for the most part, you really shouldn't be doing that kind of thing, or dopamine um, and metoprolol. Um, I've seen patients on that combination before, and that just that doesn't make any sense. Ordering 25 different autoantibodies in a patient presenting with a vague multi-system disease, just to be sure it's not autoimmune. Um, and then inevitably what happens is an ANA comes back positive uh, with a titer of 1 to 40, and that then triggers uh, a rheumatology consult to see whether or not the patient's got lupus, despite the fact the patient has absolutely no clinical signs of lupus whatsoever. Um, if you need to order more than three or four autoantibodies at a time, I would say you're probably not being thoughtful enough with, with your ordering. Like you probably haven't thought through the patient to figure out what is actually likely to be the case. Because if you order, if you start ordering like dozens and dozens of these autoantibody tests, what ends up happening is the probability of a false positive becomes unacceptably high. So much so that like a, a, a positive result is much more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. And that just causes a ton of confusion, diagnostic confusion that is, for everyone involved in the case. Ignoring the nurse during walk rounds despite he or she standing right there at the bedside. Uh, I, I really try hard to make sure that doesn't happen if, the, if you know, I try to let the nurses know when we're, when we're rounding. Uh, it doesn't always happen for a variety of reasons, but I try to let them know. Um, and if the nurse comes over, uh, then I definitely will want them involved in the discussion. They know a lot of things about the patient that we don't. They have all the updated information. They're there with the patient, you know, much, much more frequently than we are. Um, and they, they're, they have a, this incredible wealth of knowledge um, about the bedside condition of the patient that we are going to totally miss out on if we don't actively engage them in rounds. <laughs> Referring to professional society guidelines as if they were laws that must be followed. Um, guidelines are guidelines. They're not, they're not rules. They're not laws. They're, they give you an idea of what is typically done for a patient by most physicians in a given situation. But there's going to be lots of reasons that you may not, you know, in which following the guidelines is not the best course of action. And so you shouldn't necessarily feel compelled that you must necessarily follow them all the time. Ordering a PPI for a soft reason, which will likely be continued for years before another doctor re-examines whether it's appropriate. Uh, for some reason, PPIs are just one of these medications that doctors, they, they don't discontinue it for some reason. It just stays on forever and ever. For, and and uh, it, it, they're not benign drugs. Like they have side effects, they have toxicities. Um, and you, know, you shouldn't use them unless, unless patients really needs them. Insistence on always using the same temperature cutoff as constituting a fever and reacting to every fever in the same way, such as sending blood cultures on every patient whose temp is above 101.0, etc., or, or, or on no patients whose temp is less than 101.0. So I have a whole video about how the, our definition of fever is extremely fraught and why we should have a much more nuanced approach to 
uh, diagnosing someone with a fever and, and identifying a fever. And uh, for people who want to know more about that, I'll just put a link to the video uh, in the description to this one. Using a higher than normal hemoglobin threshold for transfusion simply because a patient has a history of CAD. So there were studies uh, years ago that found that patients with um, uh, active ischemia did better with a higher transfusion threshold than other patients. Um, often the patients will cite, uh, sorry, doctors will cite a hemoglobin threshold of 9.0 as being where you should consider transfusing by blood cells. Uh, but that is, is in a patient with active ischemia, not anyone with a history of ischemic heart disease. And active ischemia means they're having chest pain, they have an elevated troponin, they have ischemic changes on ECG. Uh, it does not mean they once had an abnormal cath five years ago. Reflexing, reflexively giving Lasix to every patient with pulmonary edema. So while this was true for many, this would be helpful for many people, um, not all pulmonary edema is caused by hypervolemia. You know, pulmonary edema is not, it's not necessarily fluid, it's not necessarily too much fluid in the body, it's too much fluid in the lungs. And, you know, for example, patients who have a hypertensive emergency, you know, where their blood pressure skyrockets for some reason, you know, because of, I don't know, they, they're uh, intoxicated with cocaine or other stimulants. Um, that's just one example. They, they have uh, a pheochromocytoma or whatever, and they develop flash pulmonary edema, and they suddenly have this, this very, very quick development of fluid uh, in the alveolar space. The, the problem is not that the patient's volume overloaded. You know, giving that the patient's Lasix, it's not going to clear their lungs out any faster. Um, giving them medications to reduce their blood pressure, reduce their afterload, that will clear out their lungs. And so when someone has pulmonary edema, you really have to think about what is the mechanism of this pulmonary edema before deciding whether or not Lasix is or is not appropriate. Uh, reflexively transfusing at, an, uh, ar transfusing at an arbitrary hemoglobin, irrespective of symptoms or other medical problems. So, like I said, you know, some people will transfuse at an inappropriately high hemoglobin threshold for patients with a history of coronary disease. Some doctors will wait until the patient has gotten down to an inappropriately low hemoglobin before transfusing. So, for example, they'll say, oh, appropriate hemoglobin transfusion threshold is 7.0 because of some trial 20 years ago that showed that. And that's all fine and good. But if your patient is having shortness of breath or extreme fatigue with a hemoglobin of 7.5, like even if they don't necessarily have a, a study proven mortality benefit to being transfused at a hemoglobin of 7.5, they're gonna feel better. So, so if someone clearly has symptoms from their anemia uh, at a hemoglobin that's above the conventional transfusion threshold, it's okay to transfuse them. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> Continuing low value, non-comfort focused medications in hospice patients. Um, you know, sometimes patients with on hospice, uh, they will uh, feel a connection to their, their chronic medications and they won't want to come off them. Like they'll choose to stay on their statin, for example, because someone has told them years ago that the statin was going to prevent them from getting a heart attack. And just because they're on hospice doesn't mean they want to have a heart attack in the next day or two. And, and even if you know as a, as a physician that taking them off the statin is not going to make any difference at all, if, if it means something to the patient, you can leave them on. But as, as the treating you know, clinicians, if you can get patients off of unnecessary medications when they're on hospice, you absolutely should do so. Over-reliance on antipsychotics for delirium before first attempting non-pharmacologic strategies. So uh, there's a whole bunch of literature about this, about how antipsychotics help delirium far less than we think that it does, or they, they do. Um, and in fact, it, in some, there are some studies that show that antipsychotics may not even help delirium at all. Um, they are definitely harmful in the sense that they can cause uh, ventricular arrhythmias uh, through, uh, through QT prolonging effects. And so they, they can kill patients. So antipsychotics for treatment of delirium in the elderly um, I'm sorry, particularly in the elderly, but also in all, in all patients, um, is, is something that you should really try to avoid unless you've exhausted all other non-pharmacologic strategies. When an outside hospital transfers a patient and fails to include a discharge summary, um, and this is particularly frustrating if they do include over 100 pages of nursing notes. This seems like it should be a really easy problem to fix in the sense that if we get a transfer from you know hospital X in the community, Three, three transfers in one year that were lacking a discharge summary, 
And I think it's perfectly legitimate for a hospital to say they're not going to accept transfers from another facility anymore because of the documentation that they've sent over has been inadequate. I think that's a 100% fine thing for the hospital to do. Routine overnight vitals and stable patients awaiting SNF transfer. So if a patient is stable enough to go to a skilled nursing facility that is a nursing home, um, they are stable enough to not wake them up at 4 in the morning for vital signs, period. Now we're finally getting to our top 10 uh, pet peeves. Woohoo! We're getting into the, the home stretch here. Daily routine labs in stable patients. Um, stable patients don't need routine labs. Like, don't do it. Like, give the patients a, a lab holiday. You know, check labs, you know, two or three times a week or once a week or stop altogether if they're just waiting for a nursing home placement. That's okay. Just because someone's in the hospital does not mean they have to get a, a CBC and a metabolic panel every single day. Uh, number nine, when an oncologist declines to consult on a patient with a high suspicion of malignancy until the malignancy is confirmed via pathology. So uh, oncologists, please don't do this. Like, I understand you don't want to waste your time on uh, seeing a patient who doesn't end up having a tumor. And I understand you don't want to scare a patient into thinking they have cancer by just showing up and announcing it to the oncologist if they end up not having a tumor. But there's a lot of value to having an early oncology input. Um, there are, are many tests that we can we can order on a patient with uh, suspected malignancy that is not going to be super expensive but will expedite the subsequent decisions that are made. Sometimes primary teams also need to know like what actual biopsy we should get. You know, sometimes we need your help to determine do you biopsy the primary mass or do you biopsy the lymph node? Like, does it make a difference? Does this patient even need a biopsy, or can we assume that because they have a prior history of a different tumor that this is just recurrence of that tumor? Which to, to, I mean, in short, you shouldn't assume that, but that might be a question a primary team has. So, you know, if, if the primary team, you know, calls for an oncology consult, don't reflexively decline it just because there's no final path report in the chart. Next, placing a hospice patient on, un, on an unnecessarily restrictive diet. Um, you know, and that, but I don't mean necessarily just like, like a low salt diet. I mean things like, you know, uh, uh, nectar thick liquid, semi solid, mechanical soft pureed, et cetera, et cetera. You know, my, uh, I've talked about this on this channel on a different video uh, with my own father when he uh, was on hospice. He was on hospice for, for five months, um, about five years ago. And, you know, he had speech pathology come by and realized that he was an as aspiration, aspiration risk. And they recommended that he be on a very restrictive diet. You know, I think, you know, pureed with thick and liquids or something like that. And my dad didn't want to do that. My dad wanted to eat what he wanted to eat. And, uh, and he that was goes both consistency and with his and with you know uh, with other aspects of his of his diet. For example, he had, you know he was a cardiac patient, so you know they recommended low fat diet, etc. And you know he ate what he wanted to eat, and, and he had like I think he had a McDonald's milkshake like literally every single day um, for four months straight, at least of those five months. Um, but it did give him a lot more. Um, I think it gave him a lot more pleasure in being able to eat what he wanted to eat in his final days. So um, someone's on hospice, just. Let them eat whatever they want to eat. It's okay. Fluid restricting patients with heart failure exacerbations. Uh, there was a really great um, thing we do for no reason article on this specific question that was done by some of my colleagues here at Stanford. I'll put a link to that uh, in the video description. Attempting and failing to control a diabetic's blood sugar with an insulin, with, I'm sorry, with only an insulin sliding scale. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing if someone comes in and they're on like, you know, either they're diet controlled diabetic or they're only on one oral medication and you want to have them on a sliding scale just for a day or two to get an idea of what their insulin needs might be. You know, that, you know, I don't know if I would advocate for that, but I, th I think it's okay strategy to do that. But if it's like hospital day number four and someone's blood sugars are consistently in the 200s or, or worse, and they're still only on an insulin sliding scale, like that's a major problem. So that really shouldn't happen. Reflexively repeat, repleting every patient's K to above four and every patient's magnesium to above two. I don't know where, I don't know how this started. I wish, I wish someone who was really into the history of, of medicine, hospital-based medicine, uh, like, you know, maybe Adam Rodman, for example, knows why this happens. I don't know why this is so common, where these numbers come from. It feels like totally arbitrary and made up. Um, and it's not necessary. You know, so 
patients having active cardiac ischemia, having active arrhythmias, I think the consensus is that, the strong professional consensus is that um, you should get those patients to a high normal K and, potassium, um, K and magnesium levels. But for the average patient who's not having any arrhythmias whatsoever, um, that's really not necessary. You know, like low normal K, low normal mag is actually okay. When the med list and the discharge instructions, med list and the discharge summary, and the official outpatient medication list in the EMR all disagree. This should not happen. In 2023, the EMR should not allow this to happen. It still does. I don't get it. It's super frustrating. And it's really dangerous for patients because patients get home and they have like, you know, you know the, the list of medications they get from the pharmacy, the, the, the actual pill bottles, and they have the discharge instructions that they're given to when they, at the time of discharge. And there's if they don't match, that leads to a lot of, of danger um, because patients don't know what to do. And they're just going to, Sometimes they'll call in and try to try to figure it out. Sometimes they just take a guess, um, and that guess is sometimes wrong. Dosing narcotics less frequently than their duration of action. Uh, you know, a patient comes in with acute pain, and they get put on, you know, oxycodone Q12. Uh, oxycodone does not last 12 hours. I don't know why people do this. I, I don't know if it's because you're afraid of overdosing them, you're afraid they're narcotic dependent, or you're trying to wean them off and try to get them down off narcotics so you keep spacing out the frequency. Um, that's that's fine to a, a degree. Like you want to space out oxycodone Q2 to Q4. Like, okay, that's that's fine. But oxycodone does not last 12 hours. You know, like Dilaudid or hydromorphone does not last 12 hours. Like don't space it out that infrequently. All it's gonna do is upset the patient. The pain is not gonna be well controlled. It's gonna frustrate the nurses. Um, and there's no, there's no reason to do it. We're getting really close here. We are at the uh, number two pet peeve of mine in the hospital. It is PRN IV hydralazine. Um, I know why people do this in the sense that like, okay, someone's, you know, it feels like it's a, a good medication to use. For patients with um, you know high blood pressures, because it's it works fast. The nurses usually have it on the floor ready to go. People feel comfortable with it. Um, why is PRN IV hydralazine a bad idea? Well, there's two more reasons. One is it can actually work better than you want it to. It can actually bring patients' blood pressure down too quickly. Um, but the second is actually it's not necessary. Like the 99% of the time when someone's got a PRN IV hydralazine order. It's written for asymptomatic hypertension. And asymptomatic hypertension in the hospital is very uncommonly an issue. Like maybe if you have intracranial hemorrhage or maybe if someone's had recent neurosurgery, you know, maybe it's a different story and someone needs to be on, you know, PRN blood pressure medications. But for someone that comes in for something completely unrelated to their blood pressure, uh, completely unrelated to, you know, their brain or stroke or neurosurgery, not having aortic dissection, you know, they come in for like pneumonia, they come in for cellulitis, or they come in for pancreatitis, uh, and their blood pressure ends up being 170 over 90. You don't have to emergently treat that with IV medications. Like you can either just wait it out and see what happens. You can either give them an oral medications a little bit sooner. You can change their oral medications. You can put them on a, a new oral medications if you think that hypertension is going to be there to stay. But there is almost never a reason to give IV uh, blood pressure lowering medications to a patient who is not having symptoms related to their hypertension. Um, it's just, it's not a necessary thing to do. Before I reveal my number one pet peeve in medicine, I'm going to discuss three dishonorable mentions. These are certainly not the only three things that could fit here but they each represent a category of behaviors or aspects of the system that don't quite fit into this ranking system. First are actions that I think are mistakes and are relatively common, but which I don't get that frustrated by because I understand why people do them. And the representative for this is prescribing tramadol. Again, I, I don't endorse the use of tramadol. I think it's not very effective. It has a lot of side effects. And notably, it's a dirty drug owing to its multiple mechan mechanisms of action, uh, multiple pathways of active metabolites, and overall unpredictable pharmacokinetics. But I understand why people use it. Treating chronic, uh, severe chronic pain is challenging, and I understand the appeal of something which is perceived to be stronger than over-the-counter options. 
and supposedly not addictive. So I get it, which is why it doesn't make it to my pet peeves list. Uh, the second category are long-standing practices that have been overturned by data that is too recent to expect to have yet transformed everyone's management. And the representative in this category is overly cautious of titration of goal-directed heart failure therapy following an admission for acute heart failure. For decades, a common ma uh, mantra on heart failure therapy was start low, go slow, with the idea that overly aggressive initiation and up titration of ACE inhibitors, spironolactone, and in particular beta blockers would lead to hypotension and readmission. I think, you know, to be honest, I think I may even have an older video on this channel which endorses this belief. However, there was a landmark trial on this topic called the Strong HF trial, uh, the paper of which was published in Lancet in November 2022. There is some nuance to this trial that I don't mean to brush over, but in short, the trial demonstrated that by nearly any measure of success, rapid titration of heart failure medications was superior to the traditional gradual titration. If I were to repeat this pet peeve list in five years, which I won't, but if I did, I suspect this would be on it. But for now, this finding hasn't fully permeated into common practice yet. And the last category of dishonorable mentions are the really big problems, big picture problems, that is, that color the entire practice of medicine. I could easily represent this by saying, the completely dysfunctional, absurdly expensive, for-profit American healthcare system. <laughs> However, this spot instead is reserved for the legal scam that calls itself the American Board of Internal Medicine, particularly but not solely due to its maintenance of certification program, which is arguably legalized extortion. ABIM doesn't make the pet peeves list because it doesn't really affect my daily practice of medicine, as much as it is something which causes a vague existential dread anytime I happen to think about it. If you have no idea why the ABIM and MOC program are so awful, I have links that explain the whole thing. Which now brings me to the number one spot on my pet peeves as a hospitalist. Notes in charts that are full of outdated and inaccurate copy and paste information and other meaningless garbage assumed to be required for billing and coding or for monitoring quality improvement metrics. If you are a physician or other medical professional, you already know this, but for everyone else in the United States, the medical notes in your chart within the electronic health record are an atrocious mess. I don't care if you are at Stanford or a Kaiser facility, a VA hospital, some private secondary care hospital in a rural area, or a large big city safety net hospital. Document documentation is just, it's flat out terrible everywhere. In 20 years, I have never seen the chart of a patient who has been in the hospital for at least 24 hours, who did not have at least one error in their chart due to autofill templates and excessive copying and pasting of outdated information. Plus notes, particularly discharge summaries, are full of boilerplate text that is usually irrelevant to the patient at hand. Now this harms patients in two very notable ways. First and most obviously, inaccurate documentation is going to lead to errors in conclusions about what's going on with the patient and thus errors in management decisions. But second, the sheer volume of information on the screen is so great that important information, what you actually care about, is easily lost in the noise. A typical discharge summary that a primary care doctor has five minutes to review before seeing a patient for a hospital follow-up visit can easily have 10,000 words, of which only 500 to 1,000 are actually relevant. So 5 to 10% of a massive document is useful to the PCP, who is its most important audience, irrespective of what insurance companies and the coding department think. And this is a solvable problem. You know, for one thing, hospitals can revise or discharge summary templates to eliminate boilerplate text, and the garbage that's necessary for the coding department and monitoring metrics should be in a separate document. There is no logical reason that insurance and quality-specific information needs to be bundled together with what's necessary for a patient's outpatient doctors 
to understand what happened in the hospital and to provide appropriate follow-up care. It just it makes no sense for this two completely different types of information to be interwoven into one document that is suboptimally useful for both parties. Anyway, so there you have it, my list of one top 100 pet peeves. Like I said, there's a lot of opinion in there and there's a lot of room for disagreement. If you think I left out something notable, let me know below.